Welcome everybody to an International Women's Day celebration brought to you by the Michigan Women's Commission. My name is Muna Jundi and I am the current chair of the Women's Commission. To learn more about the Women's Commission, visit us at michigan.gov forward slash MWC. Honestly, I'm really honored to host this panel today. Uh, for the first time in Michigan's history, women hold the majority of our top elected leadership positions. And we have almost all here on one virtual stage at the same time. Uh, if each of our guests could give a wave as I introduce you, I would greatly appreciate it. Of course, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, uh, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, Attorney General Dana Nessel, Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, Bridget Mary McCormick, and uh, Michigan House of Representative Democratic Leader Donna Lazinski was supposed to be on, but she had to drop out at the last minute. So International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. And our guests have made time today to share how they're working to create more pathways toward leadership right here in Michigan. To kick off our first question is my fellow Michigan Women's Commissioner, Charity T Dean. Charity is the Director of Civil Rights for the City of Detroit and an advisory council member for the Detroit Women's Leadership Network. Take it away, Charity. Thank you, Muna, and thank you to our distinguished guests. I'm really honored to be here with you today. So the theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge. Now, looking at all of you here together, there are a couple of things that stand out. First, as Muna mentioned, you are all in top elected leadership positions. Two, you're all women. And third, you all happen to be white women. So working off our International Women's Day theme, our first question is, how do you choose to challenge in your personal and or professional life? And in particular, how do you choose to challenge and call out gender and racial bias and inequality? And I'm gonna start with our esteemed governor, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Thank you, Charity. I so appreciate the question. I think it's so important as well. You know, as um, a new member of the legislature, I was taking care of my mom when she was dying of brain cancer and my daughter at the beginning of her life. And I was in that sandwich generation where I was sandwiched between two generations of my own family for whom I was caregiving. And I think that period of time in my life forged me more than any other. As governor of this state, I know we've got a lot of work to do to make Michigan a place where all women, especially women of color, have real opportunity and protection and respect under the laws. And that's why as I put together my team, my cabinet, I am proud that we leveled barriers with intention on the front end and we got the most diverse cabinet in Michigan's history. Not because we said we're going to do that, but because we look for the best experts and true representation. And it's an empowered group. And I think that's really important. I'm glad to see that President Biden and Vice President Harris have done the same at the national level. And I know that it's important because I can tell you this, it was Dr. Janae Caldoun, African-American woman ER doc, who saw the demographic data early on in COVID and made Michigan one of the first to report that information, knowing that lives were on the line. And it was because Dr. J was sitting not just at a seat of power, but was empowered in that seat as well. And so we didn't just save lives of um, African-American Michiganders. We saved lives well beyond our borders because Dr. J was at the table and others learned from us. And so that's how I choose to challenge. I use my platform to ensure that we create platforms for, for many who traditionally haven't had them. And I think we get better decisions and better outcomes when we do that. Thank you, Governor Whitmer. Secretary Benson. Yeah, and to underscore what the governor said, the, the, the essence of democracy and as the state's chief election officer, I'm proud to, um, to be a guardian of our democracy. I mean, that's, that's the essence of it, ensuring uh, that every voice is heard uh, and that every vote is counted and that we're doing everything we can to uplift those underrepresented communities in our state uh, and particularly those historically marginalized. I started my career in Montgomery, Alabama investigating hate groups and hate crimes throughout the country. And it was there where I was really instilled uh, with a deep sense of responsibility, particularly being in Selma at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, to continue on the work of those who've come before us to ensure that the promises of our constitution, the promise of our democracy of one person, one vote truly was accessible and available to everyone. 
And as the past year has showed, as a 2020 election cycle really demonstrated, the work to protect every voice and ensure every vote is counted is far from over. It requires all of us, as Congressman Lewis said, to continue to be vigilant, to recognize that democracy is not a state, but a verb uh, that requires all of us to uh, stand up and do everything we can within our power, within our authority, within our platforms to ensure that every vote is counted and that every voice is heard. So that's my job as our chief election officer, but I do it standing shoulder to shoulder with all of those in communities of color and communities across the country and the state who've come before us to ensure that our democracy does continue to live up to those ideals and the work will continue in the months and the years ahead. Thank you. Um, Attorney General Dana Nessel. Oh, I think you're muted. There you go. I, I think next time um, the governor wears a t-shirt, it should just say, you're on mute, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful to me. Um, anyway, uh, you know, for, for many of us, uh, I think we've tried to, to spend our career uh, before we were even in the positions that we're in now, trying to fight for justice for people uh, who were least afforded it oftentimes. And, and that's what I tried to do in my career. I, I worked as a, a prosecutor um, many times handling cases involving victims of domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, children that were uh, abused or neglected. Uh, and from there handled um, cases involving uh, LGBTQ people who had been discriminated against in a variety of different ways or who have been subjected to, to hate crimes. Uh, we're representing indigent defendants um, who generally speaking, don't seem to get a fair shake in our justice system. Uh, and so I really wanted to bring those qualities to the Department of Attorney General uh, and to utilize the office to fight for those uh, who really hadn't had a voice for a very long time. Uh, and as I always say about the Department of Attorney General and the AG's position specifically, you know, that should be a place where we truly represent all the people in this state that can't afford to hire their own attorney. And that's why we call it the people's attorney on um, this particular position. But we've tried to utilize our time in the office um, by filing as many cases as possible uh, to lift up the voices of women in our state and around the country. And I tried to pull some of the cases that we had participated in, <clears throat> excuse me, over the course of the last couple of years I've been in office, um, but I was told that we had like two minutes to talk. And so there was no way that I was gonna be able to get all these in. But case after case after case that we have joined or we have personally filed in our office, um, trying to uphold the rights of women as it um, pertained to discrimination against women uh, in reproductive rights and in healthcare, um, trying to move forward to see that the Equal Rights Amendment um, finally became part of our constitution. We were um, unsuccessful in that effort, but it doesn't mean we're not gonna try again soon. Uh, and even joining forces with many other AGs and pushing for the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which I can't believe in 2021, we still have to argue about and try and fight for it. It's not just something that automatically happens. Uh, but unfortunately, that seems to be the case. And, you know, whether you're talking uh, about um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, whether you're talking about the Department of Health and Human Services on a federal level, we've had to file countless lawsuits to try to uphold the rights uh, of women uh, and uh, of many others who have been discriminated against in housing and healthcare and in so many other places. So we've tried to utilize the office of a, a attorney general and our entire department uh, to try to assist women and women from all different backgrounds. Thank you for that. And uh, Chief Justice McCormick. Well, thank you very much for facilitating this conversation. It's um, an honor for me to be part of it. And uh, I always learn when I get to um, listen to my, uh, to these amazing women leaders of our state. Um, there's, there is a really interesting mismatch between uh, the way so many of us really value diversity and inclusion in our workplaces um, and the separate feeling that they're meritocracies when academics, um, ask people in their workplaces um, whether they are meritocracies. They always say yes, overwhelmingly. Everybody wants to believe that we all got where we are because of um, a meritocracy. And 
Um, I think we have to disrupt denial. I mean, if we really want real change, we have to disrupt denial. We have to become aware of how inequality shows up in all of our organizations and be willing to talk about it even when it makes us uncomfortable. Um, if you wait for complaints to be lodged, it's too late. Uh, they've already, they're, they're already gonna have done uh, damage. They're gonna have discouraged people from raising their hand who would have um, made your organization stronger and better. Um, it's too late. We have to invite conversations about what barriers women and people of color face in our own organizations, in our own teams, in our own industries. And we have to start those conversations and be willing to, um, uh, uh, to have them when they're uncomfortable. I, I, I believe it's the only way to make the invisible experiences of inequality visible um, and we can lead that way. And then the, 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 the second, I'm, I'm, I'm totally into like practical, like practical things to do nowadays. I'm like, what can I get done? Um, and the other thing that I think um, is really important is challenging our male allies to lead as well. Um, I, I had um, primarily male mentors early in my career um, and I am full of gratitude uh, for their willingness to mentor me in those ways. And we can use all the help we can get. So let's make sure we challenge our male allies to lead um, as well. Thank you, Chief Justice. I'll say um, it just, it's very refreshing to hear that at all levels of government, we're thinking about ways that we, uh, to your point, disrupt denial and really identify and deal with um, inequities. So thank you for that. Um, Muna, are you ready for question number two? I am. Uh, so digging a little deeper into your responses, you know, you talked about uh, being advocates for women. You know, my fellow commissioner, Whitney Gravel, has me hooked on this mantra, climb and lift. So um, we'd like to hear from you on, you know, how you work together with other women to amplify and elevate women in leadership. We'd especially like to know how you're using your roles, power and privilege to invite in and center the voices, expertise and experience of people of marginalized races, ethnicities, and genders. I first would like to start with you, Chief Justice McCormick, since you were on a roll. <laughs> I know, but maybe people are sick of hearing from me, but okay. Um, so I think this is such an important topic and I'm so glad we're able to talk about it. And I can't wait to hear from my friends about it. Um, like I said, in response to the last que question, I've become very goal oriented and sort of, um, what can I get done oriented? I don't know if I'm getting old, I'm older than everybody else here. And I feel like I, uh, I'm, I'm worried I'm running out of time and I feel um, uh, like some urgency about um, making sure um, I do everything I can in my power to, to, to raise up um, women and people of color into leadership positions in law. Um, I'm in a lucky position right now because there are a majority of women on the Michigan Supreme Court for the um, first time that I've been on the court. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty tremendous. Um, but throughout the legal field, women uh, still struggle in to, to, to get to and stay in top positions, leadership positions. That's true in the private sector. It's slightly less true in the public sector, but it's still true in the public sector. Um, and I, I guess I just feel some urgency lately about um, what can we do that's practical. So I am personally thinking, what, what, what do I know and how, what, what can I do to help people, um, women and people of color get into leadership positions? Well, I know a little bit about running for judicial office, it turns out. I've done that a couple of times now successfully. And as a quick sidebar, I wanna say that in 2012, when I had never run for anything at all, um, Jocelyn Benson, who did not know me, Secretary uh, Benson, who did not know me, sat down with me for a very long time and spent a lot of time with me, encouraging me and introducing me to people she thought I uh, should get to know and uh, uh, telling me she believed in me. And uh, I, uh, that's the kind of thing that, that, that we can do and that I can do now for, for women who are interested in um, uh, running for judicial office. And so I've spent a lot of time on that in the last couple of years and intend to spend a lot more time on it in the next few years. Um, I feel very uh, grateful that um, the governor has um, been very interested in, in the applications of women and people of color for um, openings on courts. And I've tried to help with that as well, as well as bring in my colleagues some of whom know a little bit more about the appointment process than I do because I came, I, came I came here the old fashioned way. 
Um, but I, like I said, it feels like a little bit of a numbers game to me now. The, 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 the biggest way to change our cultures is to change the people who make leadership decisions in our cultures. Like we literally just have to get more women and people of color into the leadership positions in our cultures. I don't know if anybody saw um, Bradley Gayton, who's now the general counsel at Coca-Cola. He was a general counsel at Ford. He was a long time Michigander. We, so we, probably people know him. Um, African-American who recently um, said Coca-Cola will no longer engage law firms unless they have a certain percentage of um, people of color and women working on their projects. I mean, he's just decided like enough already. We're just, we're not engaging you anymore unless you actually uh, show up with uh, a diverse team. So I'm really into practical solutions right now. And it's literally, how can I remind women uh, every young woman that talks to me and worries about whether they are, they are competent enough and they're plenty competent um, and re reminding them that confidence is not competence and that they are plenty competent and we can get this done. Thank you. Um, so next, uh, when you're not posting about cats on Twitter, Attorney General Nessel, um, what are you doing to uplift women in leadership? Uh, in fairness, they're mostly female cats. So I think that that is helpful and uplifting. Um, uh, yes, uh, women, feline, uh, all over the, well, my house, just at my house, not really even the state of Michigan. Um, so, you know, when I walked into uh, my, my office, um, frankly, during the transition period, uh, right before I took office, I was sort of shocked because I walked into an office where I would, uh, I had all of my division chiefs and bureau chiefs uh, and the members of, of executive that would plan to stay on in, in one room. Uh, and I, I was a little shocked because um, I, had, I had come from, my government service had been in Wayne County. I worked for uh, Wayne County prosecutor, Kim Worthy. And I was used to uh, an office that looked like that office where I worked, where there was an incredible amount of diversity and a lot of strong female leadership. And I, I walked into an office that was basically the diversity was there were your your white straight Christian men who wore long ties and your white straight Christian men that wore bow ties and that was really the most diversity that that I could identify <clears throat> and it was startling to me because I thought of all the voices in the room that you know were not there and people who were not representative in the highest levels uh, of the law firm that represents the state of Michigan and the people of the state of Michigan. Um, so some of the things that I did, you know, um, in bringing in uh, a solicitor general who's the top appellate attorney in the state, um, uh, I hired the, the first Muslim uh, woman ever to be appointed SG in the history of the United States of America. Um, her name is Fadwa Hamoud and uh, she serves in uh, my executive team. My chief deputy uh, is a woman, my director of communications is a woman, and most of my higher level positions in the office right now are filled um, by women. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, in terms of deciding, you know, who would take different roles in the office uh, of leadership, it was very important to me um, that there be some parity there, that we had, uh, I know how many women we have who are attorneys in the state of Michigan. I, it's baffling to me why you wouldn't have similar numbers in place, not a quota system, but just recognizing the contribution of so many great attorneys uh, in the state of Michigan that are women and that are people of color. And so I've tried very hard to make sure that we elevate those voices and that people who have been marginalized over the course of many years and not been provided with those opportunities, now they are. And it really changes the construct uh, of the office and, and the ideas that we banner about. And frankly, I think it's a much more collaborative environment there than perhaps um, has ever existed in that particular space. And it helps us represent the people of this state, I think in an entirely new, different and better way. Uh, and the other thing I will say is this, you know, when you look at the, the women who you're showcasing who are on right now, you know, the four of us work together all the time. Um, Governor Whitmer, Secretary of State Benson, they are my two most important clients. Uh, and um, in representing them, I, I try to serve the interests of the state and I try to serve the interests of their, their office. But what 
I think makes us most impactful and effective is the fact that we generally get along with each other. We listen to each other. Uh, we care about what the other person thinks. And I, I, on my end, I, I like representing them and I enjoy them as friends as well, which I think really actually matters. Um, uh, with Justice McCormick, our department works with her all the time on all sorts of initiatives. And when we see failures in the justice system, whether it's in probate court, whether it's in criminal court, whether it's new laws uh, that need to be put in place to help our justice system work better, uh, Chief Justice McCormick uh, is the first person to line up to say that she wants to be of assistance in that. So all four of us work together incredibly collaboratively. And I can't speak for what state government was like before I entered uh, in January 1st of 2019. Um, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, not as good as it is now. Uh, because I, I think it's important to have um, those of us who are in these great positions of authority want to work together to improve the lives of the people that we serve. Um, so that's that's some of the work that I think we've done. Uh, and I know all of us intend to move forward, continuing to work together to do as much as we can to make the difference we can in the time that we're there. Thank you. Uh, Governor Whitmer. Well, thank you. I, I'll keep it quick because I know we're coming to a close here soon. You know, uh, as the Attorney General just mentioned, you know, at the beginning of this um, quest, as we were running for office, we all confronted someone who said, there, we can't have too many women on the ticket. And uh, we each had a different path to landing on this ticket, and we won. And it was the three of us, plus, of course, Garland Gilchrist um, and Debbie Stabenow. And, and so we showed that, yes, we can be competent, we can lead, we can be those women from Michigan, which we all are. Um, I think that over the course of 2020, I can't tell you how many times I said, thank God I have Dana as my attorney general, and thank God we got Jocelyn running this election. But for all three of these things happening, um, I just don't know how we would have confronted 2020. I'm also grateful for uh, our chief justice who combined her efforts with our lieutenant governor and delivered um, on an agenda around criminal justice reform. So I'm grateful to have had have so many women with whom I work very closely. And I'll just tell you one of the moments that it really hit me. We've got over, I think 65% of my executive office is female and more than half the cabinet is female as well. Um, but I was having a meeting with Fadwa Hamoud, the solicitor general as the attorney general just mentioned, um, Kim Worthy, African-American woman, of course, prosecutor, with my legal team, Susie Shkreli, uh, Albanian-American woman, uh, Winona Single, who is a Native American woman, Karina Andorfer, um, a Hispanic-American woman, and Shanique Moss, African-American woman. And I kind of sat there taking in all these lawyers with, from all these different perspectives and backgrounds, and it was like, that's what meetings are looking like here in Michigan now. And that's not happening in Washington, DC. That's not happening in other states, but it's happening here because we are committed to um, ensuring that, that we are empowering and, and giving voice to and working you know, incredibly well with, with other women um, who wanna get things done and, and do it right. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Secretary Benson. Well, yes, I mean, just to echo, uh, I mean, gosh, how lucky are we all at this moment to be able to serve alongside each other? And I think what that is born from is the fact that we've also, the, the four of us uh, have worked together for the better part of a decade in different roles. And we all come to our roles with a sincere commitment and interest in doing the jobs we were elected to do. And, and through that, and with an expertise to inform that work. And I think through that, we've developed the mutual respect the attorney general mentioned, and also a partnership so that we can call it and find ways, call each other and find ways to collaborate. An example of that is uh, shortly after we were sworn into office, I reached out to the governor and said, you know, how do we make this more than a moment? We're the only state in the country led by women at this moment. What can we actually do beyond that to invest in the growth of women leaders in our state? And through that collaboration, the governor and I created a task force on women in sports, recognizing that a lot of the women in C-suites position and a lot of the women in leadership positions in multiple industries have a background as athletes 
athletes as, as she and I both do and have an, a background in some way in sports. And so through that, we created the nation's first ever task force on women in sports that is now uh, developing proposals uh, with an eye towards the 50th anniversary of Title IX next year uh, to really position our state as a leader and in investing in the growth of other women leaders uh, throughout our state at the, at the youngest uh, level in multiple different ways. So that's an example, I think, of, of how through collaboration, we can identify ways to lift up and ensure that, well, you know, not, not to use a phrase that's now been used a lot, but, but while this moment uh, is the first time that women have been leading our state and with a, a, a female uh, vice president of the United States, we all want to make sure that it's not the last. And in doing that and supporting each other, supporting young women, supporting all women uh, who are rising uh, through the ranks to essentially speak their truth uh, and, and, and seek their power uh, and knowing that we'll have their backs as we have each other's backs all along the way. I mean, through that, we can really ensure that this is, is, is not just a moment, but it's one that continues where we see true diversity uh, representation and uh, leaders who look like the rest of the state representing all of us together and working together to improve uh, and serve the people of Michigan every day. Uh, so that's what our leadership together, I think, emulates. And it's great to celebrate that uh, this History Month. Thank you, um, everybody. On behalf of the Women's Commission, thank you for all the ways that you're amplifying women's leadership in our state. Uh, Governor Whitmer, can I turn it out over to you for closing remarks? Sure, Mona, thank you so much. And, and Charity and the commission and my colleagues and friends here, uh, you know, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Chief Justice, I know that um, the House Democratic leader, Donna Lazinski, was going to join us, but couldn't. That's what happens when you've got these offices. But I'm glad the rest of us could convene. And this is um, certainly about all of us now, but this is about our daughters and our sons and the future of our state, our neighbors. And when I ran for governor, I knew this job would be hard. Of course, I could never have imagined what 2020 would bring. And yet I've gotten through this year because of these other phenomenal women that we've been talking to today, because I focus on the lessons from my mother, but also the hopes and dreams of my daughters. And I know that we've all had to um, gird ourselves to get through 2020. And we've had to make tough decisions and we've had to stare down people who were intent on harming us or our loved ones. And yet, I think in this moment, um, we have real clarity about how much progress we still have to make. Uh, working closely together with the other women here every day and all of you, I know we're up to this challenge. So thank you for giving me inspiration. Um, thank you for giving all of us inspiration in the work that you do every day. And we will continue to do the same as, as leaders in the state. So thank you everybody for hosting this. Thank you for acknowledging um, this important moment. And um, I'm so glad to be on the same team with all of you. Okay, end it. All right, great.